Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, our panel discussion on the art market. Uh, we, we're going to kick things off with um, uh, Claire giving us a little summary, uh, a short summary of the top findings of her latest report, which is on the art market in 2017. Um, so. I'll hand it over to you, Claire. Thank Thanks you. very much, Enid. I'm delighted to be here, especially here in Asia, which has been so pivotal in the, my global research over the last 10 years. It's been a very uh, uh, important market, influencing a lot of the aggregate trends. So I'm just going to fly through some of the main ones in the report. Um, in terms of the big picture, 2017 was a positive year overall, so it's a kind of positive news in terms of global sales. The market was up um, 12% to just under 64 billion, and that's after a couple of years of declining sales. So there's still a lot of things going on in the world. It's not a perfect picture, but we did see some more economic growth, um, growth in wealth, particularly at the high end, um, strong supply, and a lot of these things all fed into a more optimistic picture for, for sales globally. Um, one thing that is still a dominant feature, though, and has been really since the market kind of contracted in 2009, is that um, it's been very much top-end uh, driven growth. So we saw some prices last year, even in the auction sector, obviously, that, that we never imagined were even possible. Um, but when you peel back the layers, some of the other segments of the market not doing it as well. Um, looking at the major art markets, it was a positive picture. The U.S. has been really driving growth since 2009. It had a difficult year in 2016, but, but recovered very well in 2017, up to $26.6 billion, an increase of 16%. Um, the, U, the U.K. and Europe generally also had a positive year. The U.K. was up 8%, but over 10 years, perhaps a little bit more stagnant than the U.S. and, um, and China. Um, and if you look at the UK, has been the, the driving force of growth in Europe, but um, it's been growing at about half the rate of, of the US since 2009 and also about half the rate of China. So it's a little bit more stagnant picture in um, Europe. China has been an amazing one to watch. Um, obviously, it came from kind of nowhere in 2005, 2006, and it, it, it boomed up to 2012, but then had a relatively difficult period the last few years, but also grew quite substantially in 2017, driven by the very dominant auction sector in China. So China was up 14% as well. And these growth rates obviously affect the um, global market share, and the U.S. very much still the dominant market. The margin between the U.S. and the other markets growing again, it narrowed a bit for a few years, but it's now you know, over 20% between the U.S. and other markets. China and the U.K. have seen a lot of reshuffling. China took over from the U.K. as the second largest art market in 2010. Um, and since then, there's been a bit of kind of jockeying for, for second place. And China was the second largest market in, in 2017 by a small margin. Um, I think there is some currency issues here also that the UK, the pound obviously deteriorated quite substantially. That's been the main effect from, from Brexit was a deteriorating uh, sterling. So perhaps if the pound was in a better place that, that margin might have been slightly different. But nonetheless, China has been amazing to see that it came from a share of about 5% in 2006 to the current 21% it is now. So that's been quite substantial. And I think what's amazing about this, this um, market share is that there's so, so much dominance in these three marketplaces. So we see a very global market in terms of buyers, but in terms of where the sales take place, you know, over 80% of the market is in, within these three marketplaces. Um, we've seen different performance between auctions and dealers. So um, in 2016, the share of uh, private sales, dealer sales, rose quite substantially. And in 2017, the auction sector um, picked up a little bit more. And what tends to happen, um, I think the optimistic general climate helps the auction sector more. Um, it really sky's the limit at auction. If it's a good, positive um, a bullish market, you can get better than anticipated results when you sell something at auction. Whereas if it's a declining market, it, uh, it's a bit more risky. People tend to shift into the, into the um, dealer sector more. So we saw that slightly reverse from 2016 in 2017. Um, looking uh, at the two different sides of the market, um, this, is, this is what I mean when I say the dealer, um, in the dealer sector, higher end, uh, the higher end performance taking, taking, driving most of the growth. Um, nearly all, this is according to the results of the, the surveys that we do, nearly all of the um, dealers with turnover less than a million saw a decline year on year. 
but those over 50 million had the strongest growth. So, so there's the growth in the dealer sector of 4% year on year, really driven by high end sales, and not all of the market doing well. And the unfortunate thing about this picture is that you know over half of the dealers in the survey are at the lower level. So this is the problem with with the higher end growth. Um, how are dealers making those sales? Um, the gallery is still the dominant. Uh, place for making sales. 48% of sales, according to dealers, are made through their gallery. But you can see here that art fairs are a huge component now. 46% of sales made through art fairs. And dealers often say that um, you know, the, the time it takes, the amount of money they spend attending art fairs is nearly like running another gallery. But we can see here that it is generating nearly an equal amount of sales. So there is some returns to those art fairs as well. Art fairs Sales at art fairs, according to the estimates we, we can do from the surveys and dealer sales, um, increased quite substantially, up 17% to 15.5 billion. Obviously, the, the, they've grown phenomenally in the last um, seven or eight years. Alongside that, though, costs to attend art fairs also rose by about 15%. So a 17% rise in sales and a 15% rise in costs. So the returns to art fairs didn't expand that much. And again, some of the sales are dominated in the high end. The costs are, are more spread evenly. But again, this kind of do dominant feature where a lot of the sales are driven by the high end as well. So um, the sales are, are coming through art fairs, but they haven't been coming for free. The auction sector had a phenomenal year as well, just uh, discussing auctions. The sales on aggregate um, increased by... Um, 27 percent, so it was a huge, uh, huge year for auctions. All of the sectors did fairly well. Um, f fine art sales are shown here. Um, all did very well. There, there was a kind of a, a big dip in 2016, so that the recovery from many markets. Obviously, the the European All Masters did very well with the Da Vinci sale, and that would have de declined without it. So there is some kind of outlier variables, if you like, in, in the marketplace, but all of the sector is doing very well. And post-war and contemporary and modern still accounting for the majority of sales in the fine art auctions. 73% 70, of sales at fine art auctions are still in post-war and contemporary. And one of the big reasons that they're dominant is because this is where most of the, the market over a million is. And the fine art auction sector is very skewed. And again, you can see how dominant the top is by value. Um, so here are sales for less than $50,000. 90% um, of lots sold are for less than 50000 50, but they only make up 9% of the value of the market. Whereas if you look at sales for over a million, um, they only account for 1% of lots sold, but that accounts for 63% of the value of the market. And you can see here very clearly that, that a third of the value of the market is it for sales um, over 10 million. Even though there are a tiny number of lots the, the value, nearly a third of the marketplace in fine art auctions is, is in that 10 million plus bracket. And that's been growing the fastest by far over 10 years. It grew the fastest in 2017, um, but also over 10 years, the kind of pink and red lines are the market over a million and the blue lines are the market below a million. So you can see over 10 years that has actually declined, whereas the market over a million has kept rising. And this is, this is the problem with these the, the industry results that I present. They look positive, so it's 12% increase in sales, but it's a very mixed picture. So it's the, it's the market above one million that's really been driving that, particularly in the auction sector, but also in the dealer sector as well. So the top end is dominant in nearly every um, sphere of the market. One place that is kind of a bit more optimistic for the rest of the market is online sales. These are still at a much lower level. And they had growth in 2017 as well. They grew by 10% um, year on year, a little bit slower than the market overall. And they now account for 8% of the value of global sales. Um, 5.4 billion in 2017. And much of that, about 85% of that is sales by traditional auction houses and dealers selling works online rather than the online only um, marketplace. So that's still relatively small, but, but it is a growing se segment. Um, you know, it's been growing a little bit slower than, than um, online retail and other industries. If you look at since 2014, online retail has grown at over 70%, whereas in the art market it's grown you know, by about 20 to 25%. So it is a little bit slower, but it's, it's an optimistic area because this is a key area where auction houses and dealers are accessing new buyers. So we did some surveys, and again, 40% um, you know, of people that are buying online plus um, in, in auctions and dealers are new to the companies. So this is a huge... Um, 
area of optimism, I think, for the middle and lower, lower um, ends of the marketplace. Oh, sorry, is this one last? I was just going to say, which is actually cr quite crucial because why does it? Why does any? Why does the sales moving to the high end make a difference? Why does you know sales moving from Europe to Asia make a difference? This is the cr the critical thing: is that you know the the art market has a very important economic impact. There's over 310,000 businesses. It supports three million jobs that are not just any jobs. They're they're gender balanced, very highly knowledge intense jobs, um, and the the market spends a lot of money. Um, you know, 19. 0.6 billion in ancillary spending, and you can see how much um, impact it generates in fairs like this um, to the economies that host them. So this is what's at risk when everything starts to shift, when the sales start to shift. Sorry, I mean, absolutely fascinating findings, and it is it seems to be a story of, you know, it just just really really um, intense, you know, concentrating of activities in certain segments and geographic areas. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start um, by asking. Alex and Noah, about um, now, you know, we're looking at what happened in 2017. What about now? No, right here. Yesterday in the evening, um, my email inbox was flooded by very positive, very bullish um, sales reports from, from the fair. Um, uh, the, the William de Kooning at uh, Levy Govey was sold for 35 million US dollars. Um, the Mark Bradford exhibition at House and Worth at H. Queens was sold out. Um, is this, um, are, are the two of you um, feeling rather bullish um, about 2018, um, or are there you know, headwinds on the way? Yeah, thanks, um, Enid. Thanks also, Claire. I, as the, the, the sort of Art Basel um, delegation on stage, I just wanted to thank Claire for this report. This is the second year we've done this now in collaboration with UBS. It's tremendous research. Um, you guys are all here in the room actually coming to listen to us speak, but anybody that's following this online um, should download this report. Um, it's free. Regarding um, the question about the market, I mean, I've been attending this show for, I, I, since 2011, since before Art Basel. I mean, it's just extraordinary over that seven, eight year period to see how it's grown. Um, two things really struck me yesterday. I mean, one was just the, the quality of work at the show at the high end. Uh, you mentioned the de Kooning at, at Levy Gorvey. Um, but throughout the show, I mean, there's a lot of great young galleries um, that are really stepping up um, and doing better and better presentations. In terms of who's here, it's also extraordinary. Um, I, I live in New York and, and represent Art Basel in the Americas. The amount of um, the professional art community from the U.S. and Latin America that's here this week is extraordinary. Um, advisors, consultants, private collectors, museum directors um, are really here in force. And I think that's led to this tremendous feeling that you were sort of noting um, on the floor yesterday. So we're absolutely, you know, medium to long-term bullish. I was logging in um, to my Yahoo Finance account this morning uh, to see what the markets were doing. The markets, of course, yesterday were down quite a bit. Um, they're down 10% since the end of January. Um, so things over the last year or so have been quite bullish on a whole, but we're also sailing into to some interesting headwinds. So um, overall, I think we remain, you know, really bullish on the market and certainly the developments that, that are happening um, globally and in this part of the world especially, but you know, one can't always be too certain. And markets have, have gone up and down over time and, and you know, we, we always look at that as well. No, I'd agree with, um, with Noah. I mean, having been here six years and working with collectors in Asia, the, the amount of interest in art, in contemporary art, and especially actually in, in Western post-war and contemporary art, has grown significantly. So there are a number of reasons to be bullish. There are more collectors, um, there is more great material that is being brought to this part of the world. I remember when I arrived here, what we would see at galleries um, was not the best material. We wanted to test the market, and I think that goes in phases. Um, and now we're at a point, I think at a pivotal point, where we have really knowledgeable collectors, um, galleries who know that collectors from Asia do their research, they travel, they go all over, around the world. And so what we're seeing here is as good as it could be in, in London, in New York, or anywhere else in the world. And in addition to that, there are just more collectors that are coming to the scene. There's a new generation of um, Chinese collectors that are emerging, um, and new collectors from Southeast Asia. So yes, I'd agree, there's a lot of reasons to be bullish, but as I think your, your um, report pointed out, the market is, is still quite split. 
there's whatever is very blue chip, as we call, and there's um, emerging art, and there's whatever is in between. So we need to look at this in different segments as well. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, um, your report said you know, sales of uh, works that fetch over a million US dollars accounted for 1% of the market by volume, but so staggering 64% by value. What it means, though, is that Yes, we are seeing uh, new, you know, people keep talking about the potential of all these new young collectors, but really we're talking about a very, very small group of people, right? The very, very um, wealthy, probably less than 1% of, of, um, of, of all the tens of thousands of ten, tenants of, of, of Art Basel. That's true. I mean, th there's a growing group, as you, again, Claire's report pointed out in 2006, and the market share of China was 5 or 6 percent, and now it's over 20. So we need to leave it a little bit of time. And this group of new collectors, for example, if we talk about them, although small, is, is really growing. We are talking about the 1 percent. I think whenever we talk about works of art um, that are above a million dollars, we are talking about the 1%. Um, but that share um, is, is really growing. And it also goes into al almost of a domino effect. And that's what's interesting here. You have one or two of these key figures, whether it's in Shanghai, Hong Kong, or Beijing, who are starting to connect. And then you'll see their friends, entourage starting. So I think which, this is going to grow. Which means, of course, that it's going to, the, the demand for the top, top names it's going to snowball because they'll buy um, what what others also consider as you know safe bets or, or, or you know good quality art, uh, proven artists. But it's pretty bad luck for the for the one for all the other artists in the in the you know in trapped in this rather sluggish middle market. Um, is that are things going to get even more extreme? Do you think? Well, I mean, I, I take issue with that a little bit. I think clearly at the value side, there's a very small number of people that are driving that 64% of value above a million. I mean, but that is, I think it's growing. It's certainly more diverse than it's ever been. Um, what's extraordinary to us from the side of actually producing these events and getting in touch with all the, all the, the people that attend our shows across the world is the cross-pollination aspect, you know, where you have younger generations of Southeast Asian collectors that are now buying Western contemporary art, Western collectors that are coming here and getting interested and truly learning about art that they never knew about before. And I think a lot of that is happening well below the $1 million level, well below the $50,000 level. And that's actually what will continue to keep a lot of these smaller and mid-sized galleries in business and allow them to grow. So I think you always have to be a little bit cautious between balancing between those two. Um, but clearly, you know, I mean, one could certainly argue that there was an oversupply perhaps of, of, of content coming into the market over the last decade at that lower price point. And, and certainly business is getting harder for them, costs are rising, and it's a more competitive international infrastructure that everybody's playing in. Claire, I'd like you to perhaps turn to um, the issue of non-payment in, in China, which was highlighted in your report. Um, I mean, the, the baffling thing is that, you know, with um, the new capital controls um, imposed by Beijing, um, you would assume that um, there would be more liquidity within the mainland, and that, you know, that, so people would have the money to pay for the art that they buy at auction. But things seem to be getting worse. No. Yeah, though it did improve. I mean, this is an issue quite... It's not specific to China because non-payment or late payment, I should say, happens all over the world. People are given flexible terms at auction to, to pay for things. But um, the Chinese Auctioneers Association track non-payment in a six-month period, and it improved for a few years, and now it, it's 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 deteriorated again. And it is an issue, and there's a, it's it's a combination of things. It's a culture that's allowed it to, to persist. People are, the, the auction houses are extending these kind of flexible terms. It's also problems over um, authenticity of works, you know, that, that's, that delays payment. Um, there's a variety of things at play here. And I mean, as a kind of an economist, and it's very much a free market economist, I would hate to uh, promote more regulation in any way, but uh, this is the one sector of the art market, the auction sector in China, that perhaps needs just more enforcement of things like regulations on guarantees at auction, like they have in other markets and things like that, to, to start improving that again, because it's a dangerous um, way to operate. Obviously, for smaller auction houses, there's a cash flow problem. It's a huge cash flow problem if they're not getting paid even if they have to extend these kind of terms, so that becomes a bit more normal. So it is an issue. I mean, people have, have even um, said, should I discount the figures from China? 
Um, but I mean, it does happen in other markets as well. So you'd have to you'd have to do it for every market that that has it. I mean, these are the sales that take place. The the payment terms or the payment um, policies of the auction houses isn't isn't covered in the report. But it is something that I'd like to look into a bit more because it's as I said, it was getting better and now it's deteriorated again. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the the geographical. Um, um, a breakdown of where sales happen, um, that's also staggering. Eight, so 80% of our sold happens in Three Hong Kong, in international hubs. London, yeah. and New York. So we're seeing, so, I mean, it's a lot more global market than ever before in terms of buyers, but, you know, the buyers in New York and London are not all, for, are not all American and British. They're from all around the world. It's just, it's very, it's regionalized in terms of where the big auctions, the big big um, galleries and the big fairs take place. It's a, it's a kind of a, a, a hub. And the reason why these centers have, it's easy to say it's just where the money is, but it's not just that. It's the, it's the cultural infrastructures these um, cities have developed and very much, you can see it here in Hong Kong, it's the regulatory um, um, regimes they have in place that, that facilitate uh, tr imports and exports and that allow a flourishing market to take place. And I think that this is why the US gets it very much spot on. It, it's, very, it's a very safe place to buy in terms of being protected as a buyer, but it's a very good place to sell as well in terms of you know, being a business-friendly environment for sales as well. I mean, your clients, you know, your Western clients who come to Hong Kong, are they here to look or and, and explore or are they really here to buy and what I keep hearing of examples of um, Western collectors coming here to buy Western art um, why, 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 why do they need to do that? I think they're here to do both um, mm. and through discovering and through learning and they'll buy but what's very special about Art Basel Hong Kong is that you have the best of both worlds in my opinion and that's why you have a lot of um, collectors who are coming here because they like to see the best of the East and the best of the West. You have many Asian galleries. Um, and I think what's been great is Art Basel keeping that, that ratio as balanced as possible so that what you see in Hong Kong is not what you'll see in other fairs. So there is a huge part um, about discovery. Um, there are many museum groups that are coming. I think that number increases every year. And what's interesting as well is that it's not just a one-off. They keep coming and that keep um, that community keeps growing so they are interested in in buying and it's not just western art i think um, it's really about um, also chinese contemporary art it's about southeast asian and um, japanese so here it's really to to discover um, one point if i may just about the non-payment it could be another uh, hour to discuss this but i think it's just it's not a chinese issue it is an issue that's more global for in the art market, which is unregulated. So the Chinese auction houses are, are learning very, very fast. When you think about 10, 15 years ago, there was pretty much no Chinese auction house that could make on the top five. Now there are two of them. So it's a learning process. And what um, the Western auction houses have learned over a couple of centuries, I think the Chinese auction houses are starting to learn. Are they non-payment? Yes, but that also happens every, in other places. So I think it's, it's going in the right direction. Because I think many people like to say oh, China is all about speculation. It's a lot of non-payments. There are a lot of fakes. But I think these cliches need, will not be so valid um, for too long. Hey, to, to, to keep with the, sort of the regional theme, let's turn to the Americas, Noah. Um, you know, yes, China is, is, has been growing very fast, but America is still, at the moment, um, firmly at the top. Um, as, uh, I suppose uh, um, um, maybe we should start with a very general question, Noah. Has Trump been good for the American art market? <laughs> I knew this was coming. Well, I think Trump, oddly, has been good for art, you know, in a weird way. I mean, uh, tricky political moments have tended historically to bring out great art. You know, I think there's a lot more, and you see it in the halls here, you see it in great museums um, throughout the world. Um, you know, art that's about true social activism, um, protest, um, you know, 
it's gone beyond mere aesthetics. And I think in a weird way, um, Trump has perversely united a lot of the cultural front within the U.S. I mean, I've been following a lot of um, these student gun protests recently from afar here. So um, at that level, that's interesting. I'm not going to say that Trump per se has been good for the market, although clearly um, the tax plan um, theoretically will benefit a certain wealthy individual. Um, the stock markets, which were already on the rise before he came to power, have continued. Um, you know, they're up about 10% or so year on year. Um, but of course, within all of that, and Claire points out a lot of this within the report, there are um, potential fissures. I mean, 1031 exchanges, which in the U.S., you know, the U.S. has been a very favorable market um, for, for buying and selling. 1031 exchanges are tax-efficient ways of buying and selling, and, and that's been phased out. So, you know, there's certainly um, some degree to which the end of uh, sort of last quarter of the 20. 17 market was was catalyzed by by a lot of people buying and selling quickly before um, these exchanges were phased out. Um, I, I think really it remains to be seen. Um, you know, what we can say more broadly is that um, the tricky political climate in the U.S. Um, you know has potential near to medium term ramifications for the health of the market because there's just so many question marks right now in the U.S. political and economic infrastructure that aren't necessarily favorable, but they've not really been realized yet either. Um, but certainly in terms of um, what the political climate has done to catalyze substantive art and really push art, also the commercial sector beyond what all those cliches that we think about in terms of what, what gets brought to art fairs, um, what gets shown in commercial galleries is, is, is changing. And I think fundamentally that's actually a good thing. Um, what, what happens with that longer term remains to be seen. In terms of your other question a moment ago, in terms of what people are coming here to do and buy, I think it's really, I, I think Alex did a great job sort of summarizing it. It's, it's two things at once. Um, you have a lot of people that are coming here now to buy great blue chip Western and Asian art. Um, but there's a lot of other things that happen below the surface. I, I speak a lot to the advisor and consultant community, and, and a lot of that community from, from London, from New York, is coming here. They, they've started meeting clients. They didn't know what they were doing when they came a year, two years ago. And they started meeting young Asian clients and taking them under their wings. And that, in a way, is a great thing because it helps further professionalize a lot of what's happening in, in the local infrastructure here. And it brings people out and brings people back in. So um, there's a lot of, of, of that dynamic that's happening. And that's all part of a, a, an increasingly sophisticated market infrastructure. Um, you know, which we feel is, is fundamentally good. It's good for the galleries that are here and it's good for the artists um, to, to give them a, a real breath and substance beyond, you know, outside of the fair, 365. I want, I want to go back to, to what you just said um, in a minute, but first, tell me a little bit more about, about the West Coast market because I get mixed signals. Um, so you have you know, new, new fairs that open, like uh, Shang, uh, Photo Shanghai opened in San Francisco and then Freeze is opening in LA. And um, you know you, you hear you, you get these you know quite 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 bullish signals uh, from the market. At the same time, I also keep hearing that actually the Silicon Valley billionaires are not really that much into art, <laughs> um, and that it's not it's still a much smaller market than the East Coast. Um, do, do you agree? Mm -hmm. Well. I I hate generalizations, right? And the West Coast market is a lot of different things. LA is a very different community than the Bay Area is different community in the Pacific Northwest, you know, sort of above and beyond that. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time in, 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 in all of those markets over the last year or two. I mean, clearly there are interesting people that are involved, um, you know, in the technology world, right, that are collecting art. Maybe it's not as much as some people might have thought relative to the wealth that's been created there. Um, nevertheless, there's a huge pro uh, professional infrastructure of, of lawyers, financiers that are all involved in different ways that aren't necessarily the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world that are beginning to collect. Um, we see a lot of them in increasing waves coming to our show in Miami, for example, coming to Basel. Um, some are here this week as well. Um, you know, LA is different. LA is an artist-centric city. Um, there's some great institutions, a lot of wonderful galleries. Um, the market there is, is, is yet to totally catch up to the promise of all of that, but I think it's, it's on its way. Um, and so, um, you know, I, 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 I think that there's a lot more happening. Um, you know, within the, within the U.S. market broadly, I think one of the interesting things that we've tracked over the years is just the, the sort of spreading out um, uh, of, 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 of power and of interest from, you know, from the consolidation that historically has taken place in New York.
Um, we spend a lot of time as an organization traveling to the Midwest, to Central America, to South America. And there's a younger generation of, of, of you know, upwardly mobile professionals that are culturally interested. Um, there's a great uh, museum group that, here this week from the Tamayo, the Museo Tamayo in Mexico City, for example. That wouldn't have necessarily happened five or ten years ago. But they're here, they were in Korea last week visiting museums and galleries, and, and they're now in Hong Kong for a few days. And that's an extraordinary thing in its own right. And we're seeing more of that within the American market, in Europe, um, and really all over the world. And one thing, if I may add, is what's really clear as well is the links between the West Coast and Asia really increasing. You see a number of institutions, SF MoMA, LACMA, really coming here and not just coming here to raise funds, but to really engage with the community, try and look at projects and what they could do and realize that, that the very key geographical um, position that it has as a, as a link between also Asia and the US. And I think we'll see more Asian collectors going um, to the West Coast, they, um, going to Los Angeles, they go to San Francisco, and I think this is a part of the world that is really going to, to grow and fares, uh, more fares coming in is always a good thing. Um, no, so back to, back to the point you were making, and oh, it's relevant to what you just said too. And Claire, um, I wonder if you have um, any any statistics which can shed light on this. It seems that from all that we've heard, it, so there's strong demand from Asia for increasingly strong demand from Asia for Western art, especially blue chip Western art. Is is the same happening the other way around? Is the West, you know, huge generalization, I know, at all interested in collecting um, Asian art? Do you, first, I mean, Claire, did, have, have you seen any interesting data that would um, help? Um, there is some, some data on the, the rising dominance of kind of, for example, Asian and Chinese collectors at major auction houses and from, from the dealers that I survey. So that, that is a very strong and dominant thing. Um, in terms of the other way around, I suppose there's always been, um, you know, since I've been doing these reports, I've always, there's always been really strong uh, Western collectors of, of Asian art. Um, and there, were, there was a kind of a big peak in Chinese contemporary, you know, probably about 10 years ago. And that sort of subsided a little bit, you know, um, but, but there, there is, there's always been a very, very strong interest. And I think it is, it is growing in, in um, younger collectors especially. Um, but I think it's always been a, quite a, a, an interesting uh, way. It's just it's, sometimes it's access as well. It's very difficult to um, the the only if you're looking at old non-contemporary art, it's difficult for some Western collectors to to be uh, collectors because it's very difficult to get things out of of. China, especially sure, sure. Once, once they go in there. So they're reliant on whatever's in circulation in Western markets. And the Chinese, a lot of um, wealthy Chinese buying those and bringing them back into China. And once they've gone in there, they're out of circulation completely. So the contemporary market is, is very dynamic. But, but some of the older sectors, it's just difficult um, mm -hmm. to, to, it's not very freely traded. I mean, are we, are we, do we, do we still have? I mean, we, we, we used to have the, you know, the early sages of the world, of the Western world who lived and worked in China and had a lot of exposure. Are, do we have a new generation of collectors like that? We do, and I'm very interested in that part uh, of the market because this is what I started in Hong Kong, and I was focusing on, on Chinese contemporary art. And what I, what I saw is not only the collectors from Asia were buying, but also, and interestingly, a number of collectors in Europe and in the US, and not really the usual suspects, um, not necessarily the, the younger collectors who want to discover about what's happening in, in China, but also the very established Western collector, whether it's in New York, Los Angeles, London, or other hubs, which really work in to discover and what is happening in China. And at the same time, and it's probably not a coincidence, you really had a new generation of Chinese contemporary artists um, that are now in their mid-30s, um, mid-40s, that came, were born after the Cultural Revolution, and that were of great appeal to, to Western collectors. And so, yes, Ulysig and, and the other people in, in that generation have a fantastic collection, probably the best in the world, of the first generation of how I call them, of the Chinese contemporary artists. But now we're really seeing a, a new wave. And I think that's going to continue. We'll see more exhibitions in, in the US and in Europe of this 
new generation of, of Chinese artists. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just sort of trail on that because I think you can't separate the commercial side of this from the institutional and museological side, right? Historically, certainly in the US, um, there's not been a tremendous presence in modern contemporary institutions of Asian contemporary art. There just hasn't been. Um, you know, this week or in the last few years, we've seen more and more curators, museum directors from that part of the world coming. Um, you know, in, in New York this past fall, and, you know, the Guggenheim show that Han Ru, um, Alexandra Mon Monroe, and Phil Tanari curated was tremendous. For many people, that was the first real insight that people got into art really from the 80s to the current moment from China, in New York even. Um, and as that plays out, you know, I think the, the, the market will inevitably catch up. And as a younger generation is spending more time professionally, socially, and through the art world in Asia in its broadest sense, and I don't necessarily just mean Hong Kong and mainland China, but really throughout the entirety of Asia, um, you know, I think that spillover is inevitable and it will go back and forth. Um, you know, and inevitably as a result of that, we'll see more interesting younger Western artists that aren't the necess you know, the blue chip names that we all know being shown in institutions um, and private collections being written about by the international media um, in this part of the world as well. And I think that's the future. Um, but it, the, the one issue we have in, in Asia is the lack of mature institutions. Um, and we have seen um, a lot of new private museums um, being built and to fill that gap just so that you know, there's somewhere people can go and see art um, outside of the commercial galleries and art fairs. And um, I was um, listening to <clears> the <throat> talk by the Guerrilla Girls, of course, um, and it's a wonderful thing that the Art Basel has, has, has um, given them a platform within the fair, um, and it's, you know, it's refreshing to hear um, sort of the other side's view. And um, one, one point that they made very strongly is that the problem with private museums is that it allows collectors to to promote you know, art artists that they've collected and to sort of impose their tastes um, on the general public, much like how, how kings and queens used to do for many centuries. And um, and that um, and that it's it's not necessarily a healthy thing. What's 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 your view on that? I I, I don't think that collectors or private museums are imposing anything. I think. If contrary, they're sharing and they're showing what um, their taste is and the general public um, can see what they like, what they don't like. And it's always by seeing more, then you will um, further your taste, your eye. So there is a lack of institution, but this is changing. Obviously in Shanghai, we see the rise of private museum. In, in Hong Kong, we're, we're still waiting for M+, but it, it's coming. Um, but it, it, in between, you have other ways to, to show art. Um, and real estate is an issue, lack of space. But these are issues that I think, um, again, our solutions are, are being found. And the more we see, the better it is, good or bad. Yeah, I mean, I have two things to say in relation to that. One, education is king, right? As people get more educated and, and, and can see more broadly outside of the institutions that exist, um, I think that will change. I think we're living in a moment in which that's really happening at, at great pace right now for a younger generation of culturally interested people. Um, and then the other thing beyond that is, um, you know, one can certainly make that point vis-a-vis -vis private institutions or private foundations or collections, but to think that, you know, museums and broader institutions are somehow immune from that is also a mistake. So, you know, that, that, that dynamic has, has played itself out in different ways, you know, all over the world. And, and you know, and I think that that's all changing right now. Um, and there's a lot of potential um, in China and throughout Southeast Asia um, and beyond. And, and I think the future will look very different. Because um, if, you know, given the lack of uh, big museums, big public museums in, in a place like Hong Kong, a lot of the education has to be done online. And your reports also showed that there is you know, a slow but, but growing interest in online buying. And it is one, one place where you can buy you know, relatively affordable art. Um, how, how, but what, what, is the, what, are, what are the patterns that you spotted, though? I mean, are, are, are most of the buying and selling happening in, in, in the West, or is it all over? And what sort of art are people buying online, apart from the 
price point? It obviously does. Um, it, it lends itself to to um, certain sectors, uh, you know, things like prints and multiples, where the, where you're very sure of, of the kind of provenance and things like that. It obviously makes it very accessible. But it, I think it's it's also there's a, a the ceilings are rising on how much people will spend online, and I don't think it's necessarily driven by the art market. It's just that people are they transact online in all other areas of their lives so kind of why not art and people are no we were just discussing no, nobody's kind of really hit the home run in terms of a fantastic business model in the online sector yet there's issues in all of the, the things but nobody wants to be kind of left napping while it while the whole art world moves online so everyone's still trying to make sales in that area but i mean as i mentioned i think that the most promising aspect of it is not not to focus on the sales because the sales will just gradually keep on increasing of course they will because it's happening everywhere you know but is the is the accessing buyers um and the companies that the new online only companies that they're saying you know um, I interviewed Twyla, for example. They're, they're focusing on everybody except the top 5% of buyers. So the kind of 95% of other people that, and including people that aren't buying art at all now. These are, you know, a lot of galleries and, and auction houses to some extent as well tend to be very focused on their current buyers and not the people that will be their buyers in, in you know, five or 10 years' time. And I think that that's going to really help the art market be much more stable in terms of its infrastructure. It's looking at people that are not buying art now, but should be and you know can be. And it's the same thing with the, the wealth, you know, moving to to Asia. There's there's a lot of other luxury industries that wealthy Asian, new wealthy Asian people can spend their um, money on. It doesn't necessarily have to be art. So it's how to get those people buying art instead of buying in other personal luxury um, products. I think it's important. Yeah, and I wouldn't underestimate the lead generating potential, right? Like there's you know, the moment in which all of this is happening online at, tra at a transactional level, and we're, we're still a little bit away from that. But the extent to which galleries, um, other intermediaries are meeting new clients through, um, through the internet um, is extraordinary. Um, before I was uh, with Art Basel, I, we were involved with starting this thing called the VIP Art Fair, which is his first online art fair, and it was an online-only platform. And, um, it, it had its issues, but one of the extraordinary things was just, you know, this lead generating aspect that um, galleries in the months after we did this that had put work online, may or may not have sold anything at the time, um, were getting visitors coming into their galleries, introducing themselves at, at other art fairs because they had learned about them through their participation in this online portal. So for me, you know, it was an incredibly insightful thing because, you know, you really see how people are using the internet to research things in their own time. Um, and that will, you know, that will certainly play a more prominent role um, in this sphere in the future. I'd agree. I think you know, online and art is a great way to meet new clients and new buyers. And that's why auction houses are pushing towards that market. It's not necessarily to make big ticket sales. And I think we're talking up to $100,000 if we're looking at kind of numbers of what, what kind of works um, online, but it's really a great way to engage with an audience that wouldn't necessarily come to an auction, wouldn't necessarily come to an art fair, or maybe is a bit intimidated by going into a gallery. So this is a great entry point. And it's not just about transaction, it's also about content. And what websites, whether it's uh, Christie's or the other leading um, platforms, they bring great content. Um, some of them are now the best editorial content in my view, or one of the best. Um, and so this is really a way to enter the market. And there's a lot of supply. We need, there's more obviously uh, interest to find new buyers and online is just easy. We can access it from everywhere. But um, the, f the fact that it's still you know, r relatively small and um, you know, relatively low end means that the existing you know, hardware infrastructure of the art market, the art fairs, the, the, the gallery spaces, the, the, the need to keep all that is going to stay for a while. Of course. I mean, I think nothing replaces seeing an artwork in person. Um, nothing replaces you know, learning or meeting the artist, for example. Uh, but online uh, uh, provides something else. It's also about access. In, a, in an art world and market that's moving very fast, you can't be everywhere at the same time. And so online is not just about buying prints, photography, but you can buy great artworks that you might not necessarily have the time to go and see somewhere else. So I think that the access is really key as well online. 
I think just because there was a lot of kind of things written a few years ago about the online world's going to disrupt the, the offline thing. It was sort of disruption and democracy with these two Ds that they were saying was going to happen. And this disruption is not happening at all. I mean, the, online, the high-end um, sector is catered for really well offline, and there's no reason for it to go online. I mean, it's kind of a perk of being wealthy to be able to attend these big auctions to travel. It's for the people that are chained to their desks and kind of can't get, get a, you know, but want to be engaged in the art market. That's what it's been good for. So the democracy side has definitely happened. But in terms of everyone gets very excited in the art market that these new trends are going to completely overthrow things. And, and it's just not, it's not happening. And it's not happening because it doesn't need to happen, I think, as well. I mean, the, the last thing I'd say on that is that, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that art is always contextually driven, right? Um, seeing artworks alongside other artworks in a physical space. And I don't mean the romanticized version of viewing a work in that space per se, but like the programs that galleries build, the relationship of one artist to the next, and how, and how that all comes together um, gets lost a little bit online. Um, so I'm very bullish about the future of what's happening in that space for sure, but it will also have its limits. Um, and I think that's always going to be the back and forth of what this will look like. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Q and A's in just a minute, but just to wrap things up, last question: um, Given that so many art uh, uh, galleries are now sell doing the selling in art fairs and the cost is rising, what does it mean to to us, the audience, uh, in terms of the art that we get to see? Uh, is it becoming more and more commercial because of the pressure to sell in art fairs? I, I really don't think so. I mean, I think that, you know, it just requires a more educated and sophisticated audience. You have to be able to enter an art fair to appreciate this just one aspect of an artist's work or one particular work from a body of work. Or in some instances, there are great installations and site-specific projects that are here. But I don't, I, I, I don't really think that galleries using the art fair as an exhibition platform is inherently um, taking art into a more commercial or more reductive um, uh, a lens. I think it's just another outlet um, you know, that galleries are using. We talk to galleries all the time. I mean, historically, galleries had an exhibition program, and they did a few fairs and would bring inventory to those fairs. Fairs are now being programmed like exhibitions. Um, you have five, six exhibitions a year, and you do five or six art fairs, and you're choosing certain projects or certain bodies of work to bring in a more flat fashion across all of that. And I think that's certainly how galleries are thinking about this. Um, I think many of the artists that they work with are, are becoming more and more accustomed to what this means. And on the buy side, um, collectors are understanding it better as well. But I think art fairs in the best of instances can be an easier platform to see a lot and buy, but also a great place to meet, get to know people, and, 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 you know, and, and a lead to bring them into their physical spaces outside of here as well after that. Well, maybe, maybe we can hear the views of the audience on that. Um, um, we have um, just a few minutes left uh, before we have to leave the room. So please, please raise your hand if you have a question for our experts. A lady over there. Um, there's a mic. There's a mic coming. There was a time where a lot of Chinese artists would prefer to be in direct contact with the uh, collector versus going via a dealer. Uh, has that changed, or has uh, uh, Art Basel um, influenced this attitude or this thinking? Terrible times, of course, when that happened. <laughs> no, I think you know it's all about it's all about um, discovering and, and filtering. Um, as we said, we can't be everywhere at all times, and um, the role of an advisor or consultant is to also filter and to try to show um, what is happening as to the extent that some collectors can go and, and work directly with the, the Chinese artists. And I'm thinking, for example, of Uli Zig, who had uh, uh, obviously spent many years in China at such an incredible time of artistic production. Well, there's no better way than that. But again, I think um, it doesn't really matter in a way where it's coming from as long as it's good as long as you can see the artists that you, um, you know, are interested in and as long as you discover. So I, I don't think that the point of access is what matters the most, in my opinion. 
I I don't. I, I agree to some extent, but I don't necessarily agree either. I think there's been a tendency in China for artists to interact directly at the, in the auction sector as well, and there's been a kind of a lack of understanding by some artists. Perhaps this is according to the collectors and galleries I, I speak to about the role of a gallery. And it's mu it's about much more than sales. Obviously, it's about you know promoting their careers over a long period. And I think some artists have found out to their peril that you can generate short-term sales by going directly to auction. This is not so much split through an advisor, but by going directly to, to auctions, but you can also burn out very quickly. Whereas the, the role of a gallery is not just, it's not just a retailer, it, it's to manage their career over a long period of time and give them longevity in their sales as well as just promoting them in the short term. It, it's slow to, slow, slower to catch on, but it is, it is beginning to permeate a little bit more. I mean, the risk as well, and I'll, I, I think that's, you know, totally correct is, um, you know, if prices start rising too high domestically, you know, you get priced out of the market internationally. But, you know, that international market is precisely where institutions are going to come in, where, you know, where true long term sustainable value is going to be built. And I think one thing that we've seen, um, you know, is that this has shifted is the role of the gallery and being able to control that in a more, you know, mediated way um, and in a more intelligent way. Um, is incredibly important um, and, you know, something we believe in and I think, um, you know, is, is a sustainable good for the market as a whole. Is this, did that answer your question? Okay. Um, the gentleman over here? I, you know, as a risk asset, art, art is uh, as, a, as a risk asset, I look at art and I always wander back and forth between, you know, the speculation of something like a cryptocurrency and, and then all the way to blue chip real estate in America. All three of these categories have been really bid up by the Chinese buyer, right? All three of them have that similarity um, as, as gentrification happens here. So with, with some of the um, taking out the, the, um, the sexiness of, of the you know, tax efficiency in America of the real estate market, the residential real estate market, in, especially in blue chip cities, right? That's mirrored by those 1031 exchange, uh, nixing that. So there's talk about maybe even a 10% haircut in the blue chip cities on real estate. And they have been overbid by Chinese buyers. You know, and that includes even Canada and maybe London. But do you see something similar potentially for the art market? And you know, is there any fragrance now that reminds you of the last correction in the art market? I like the word fragrance. <laughs> But I mean, as I said, you know, I think it's very easy to get caught in a world in which we forget what happened historically. I mean, the last major bubble in the 80s was driven, you know, really by Japanese speculation on impressionist paintings, fueled largely through quite shady real estate transactions and otherwise, where, you know, where a lot of these paintings were being gifted. Um, and the changes that happened at the turn of the 90s really brought that all out. Um, I don't think we see anything quite that extreme nowadays, but, I, you know, and, and the market's grown globally. I mean, there's just so many more players involved. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't believe that's, you know, going to happen. Nevertheless, you know, if there's a huge financial market correction, um, if there are increasing pressures put on, um, you know, real estate and other parallel markets, you know, certainly the next few years could look a little bit different. Um, but the infrastructure is that much broader nowadays, too, that I think, um, any correction would, would look quite different than what happened. Um, turn of the 90s, whereby you know you really had a huge drop off, and it took the better part of a decade. And you know you see this through Claire's data for the market really to recover and and to get into the boom period that we've been in in the last period. Um, sorry, we're, we're fast running out of time. Let's have just one last question. Uh, sorry, he, he beat you to it. The gentleman in the middle. Thank you. Hey, Horowitz. Um, the, the comments that you made about the current Amer American administration are, are, are interesting. I think it's quickly to point out, not that I'm pro or against in, in, in this quorum, but to say that the current um, budget that the United States passed, the NEA, actually has a bigger budget than it had before, uh, notwithstanding that they were going to get rid of it. My question, though, is that um, so the, the rise of China story that you talked about and the numbers that, that, you, that you referenced before in terms of the global market the, the transactions are 80% of the market is in three geographies, if I, 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 what I understood correctly of what you were saying. So in that sense, we, so we know where the transactions are happening, um, and the rise of China story seems to be mostly a collecting category story, so that 
Chinese buyers historically, up until very recently, have been collecting Chinese works of art, whether they're antique or modern or, or contemporary. So my, I guess my question is more along the lines of, do we know who is buying where so that our American, what are America, what's the market share for Americans buying? What's the market share for British okay. folks well, buying, et cetera? I do have a little bit of that in the report, like from the dealer surveys, but unfortunately the sales that I track are sales on the ground, that were where they take place. So the sales in London could, could be bought by someone from the Middle East, a Russian buyer anywhere. I mean, that would be the, that would be the dream, is to have where, where all the buyers come from. And I do get a little bit of data from auction houses and from the gallery surveys, but I don't have it in the same consolidated way. But it, that would be lovely to get my hands on. <laughs> The one thing that I'll just add is looking at the Asian buyers, there's a, in one of the results by large auction house, 48% of um, the Asian buying actually didn't happen in Hong Kong. They, it's, it's really global. So uh, this is, I think, what we're going to see even more. Okay. Um, we are uh, officially out of time. Um, thank you so much to my three guests this morning. Um, Maybe we can continue the conversation outside. Enjoy the rest of your day.